sweet for me. That's okay. We're good. Okay. Um, so I see I have one person in the chat with us. Um, oh, welcome, Janelli. I hope I say your name right. Um, I hope you can hear me okay too. And those of you that are here, um, welcome to our leader or our listen planning virtual. I assume that you guys are all STEM ambassadors. Are going to be a STEM ambassador? You know what that is? I'm not a STEM ambassador. I'm just a business mentor. Okay. Mentoring Oh, okay. So you're a mentor. Are you the person that emailed me and said, yes. "Okay, perfect"? Then we'll we'll collaborate and talk more then about Delhi. Um, and you are a volunteer or some ambassador. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Miriam told you to be here. <laughs> All right. Um, so we need to recruit more some ambassadors. That's what we need to do. I need to show up on campus and start like dressing yeah, up. About everybody. thirty. Just I'll pull some streets, see if I can get my students that are here to show up for you guys. All right, so hi guys. Uh, for those of you um, that may not know, I'm trying to figure out, oh, there we go. Um, who am I? Um, I am, um, I'm Heather Friedberg. I am a Stan State alum. I graduated here uh, with my bachelor's of science with, uh, in biology with a minor in chemistry. Uh, I also got my single subject credential here as well through our credential program. I also got that in the biological sciences. If you know anything about how like the science credentials work, you have to like, I kind of technically have two if you really want to focus on it, where you have to pass a CSET for middle school. And then I think it may have changed now because I just recently had a student teacher this last semester that was saying that if you have like your majors in biology, you don't have to take the CSET for biology uh, to have that uh, credential. And I was like, that's unfair because I had to go through all that process. Um, but so that might be the new thing now. So like if your major is chemistry, you go into the credential program, you don't have to take the chemistry CSET because you have the degree, which makes sense to me because you're already an expert in that. I also have what they call a CTE, which is also a teaching credential. Uh, it's for career technical education. Um, and specifically that's in health sciences and medical tech. How I was able to get that teaching credential is because prior to me coming to Stan State, I actually was a pre-nursing major, just like half of the other Central Valley that's here. Um, I went through, tried to apply to the MGC nursing program, uh, got waitlisted and accepted, but um, I also had 10 years of clinical experience underneath my belt. So I had, I worked as a CNA, as ER tech, I worked um, on the rehab unit floor, I worked for 101, so 5150s and everything else that goes on. And I literally did everything in a hospital except become an RN. Um, so all that clinical experience with my biology degree, some of those things where I feel like sometimes things happen for a reason, which allowed me to get the CTE in health sciences, which allows me to actually teach the biotechnology classes I teach right now at Enox High School. Um, I'm also, they call, but if you go on into education and you want to be a teacher, the word PLC is going to be forever um, used in education. It's called personal learning communities or professional learning communities. And what that means is uh, people who, so like um, science teachers will get together and collaborate and discuss student data and how to teach things, math teachers, history teachers, they all kind of group up in their own little PLCs. Um, I am the PLC lead for our health science and med tech um, teachers in our district. So I meet with them once a week and we all discuss uh, student driven data, curriculum, and our CPD career and college standards as well. Um, I've been teaching at Enox High School for about five years. My first year teaching was at Hanshaw Middle School as a seventh and eighth grade science teacher. Um, I'm also the Dungeons and Dragons Club advisor, uh, the HOSA advisor. HOSA is a Health Occupational Student Association. I believe Stan State is trying to start one on our campus as well. Um, that provides medical opportunities, leadership opportunities, scholarships, and um, internships, and everything else for those students uh, to become future medical careers. And then like a joke that I am the STEM ambassador OG. So when our STEM ambassador program started here at CSU Stanislaus, I was like part of the few that started the first year that STEM ambassador program started here. I did over a hundred hours of service for our STEM ambassador program. It count all those hours counted for me before I entered the single subject credential program. 
and I, I was able to get more hours like than any student. And the beautiful part about our STEM ambassador program is that because I was able to already design lessons before I even met the credential program and I was already in front of a classroom doing science with students, it made me less nervous when I entered the credential program. I mean, I was able to just do the one semester route. I was already working by my second semester in the credential program. It makes you super prepared to be a teacher. That's my advice there. And it looks great on applications as well for like med school, because you have to do, well, you're already an educator as a doctor. Um, there's many ways why you should join STEM investor program. So I know I have one of you um, um, online with me, but for all of you, would you guys like tell me your name, your major, and your purpose for being here, if you don't mind? So I'll start with my room. I'll start with you. Um, for being here. Or you can tell me your purpose at Stan State too, that's cool. Perfect. SpongeBob, okay. Well, my name's Harleen, I'm a bio major, and I already graduated in May, but my purpose for being here was to initially go through the pre-med route in order okay. to go into med school, and I'm currently working on that. I don't have a favorite cartoon character, but I do like the teddy bear Ted. I don't know if you guys have watched that. Yeah. Movie. That's my favorite character. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then my person that is online. What's your name, major, your purpose for being here, and your favorite cartoon character? I wish they had like dot dot dots that would show you like what they were talking about. Just uh, not. Yay! Yay, a math major. Yes, we need more of you. <laughs> Please be a teacher. <laughs> uh, we definitely need more uh, math teachers that are great teachers for sure. And what's your favorite cartoon character? Okay, I'm Belle. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am a, I love Ariel for, you know, you know why. Redhead hair, you know, I gotta love it. Um, my students, I, I, I'm incorporating this question because if you ever have to run a STEM ambassador thing, uh, you want to get those kids talking early and they love to talk about things other than school. Cartoons is one of them. Even though I teach juniors and seniors at that biotech level, they'll still talk about SpongeBob and other cartoons that I learn about. Um, I grew up on Miss Frizzle having red hair as a science teacher. She's my uh my role model and i do i'll dress up as her like on halloween as well and then uh, ursula i just love the villains and all things spooky so um, good. okay so lesson planning like if you are somebody who wants to start a lesson where do you start where do you begin what do you like how, how does how does someone begin in starting a lesson planning where does that thought process go? For me as a teacher, what guides me is my standards and my units and the content and curriculum that our, our um, district gives us, that, that guides me. But if you're given free reign, like we are here at, at Stan State for our outreach programs, where do you begin? Um, I liked, when I was here as a STEM pastor, I like to start with what I loved. So as a biology major, I loved like, all the organisms. I love the living things except cockroaches. But like I loved, I love all aspects of biology. Um, so I kind of went in that area. So like, for example, like we did a, a biology boot camp week. Um, I did a plethora of other things. I even did an engineering one just because I thought it would be fun. I wasn't, I'm definitely not an engineering major, but we made it work. Um, so I would start with your favorite stop topics in STEM and how you would make them fun. What gets you excited? So if you are just to say, for example, DNA is not your thing and you're a chemistry major and you just want to like, you know, blow some stuff up. 
uh, don't choose DNA. Do what you love to do because the kids will feed off that energy. They know when you're not excited about your topic. They're not going to get engaged. They're going to kind of, then the behaviors are going to start kicking up. So if you're excited about their to your topic, they probably most likely will be too. Um, you can also, maybe you're like, oh, I want to do this. But I don't know if it's okay. But you can also ask the STEM ambassador team what materials are available. Dr. Grover, do you still have like the buckets and stuff like that that you guys take? Yeah. So you could look for the list of materials that are available. Maybe you can find one that you'd like. Maybe you can create a lesson plan from there or revamp one that has already been done. I know that like the cell model was a big one, DNA extraction. What else, where am I at? What else do you guys have that are like the top? Oh, top robots. Oh yeah, the little guys. Fuller suitcase. Yeah, take them and go figure it out. Like go um, run wild, create a day out of it, do a science Saturday out of it. It's just a couple hours. Kids come here, they get excited. Uh, that's where I would start. Just find something you're really passionate about it and just do it. Um, and then, or maybe if you're, you're going to go reach out and go to a classroom or you're going to collaborate with a teacher, ask them and where they need help at. So some schools in our area may not have the materials to do a lab that, that goes on to their unit. So if they know that like, hey, like for example, I went to Turlock, Turlock Junior High, so at junior high and the teacher needed a little more support for photosynthesis. And so I brought a chromatography lab for them, which demonstrated the different pigments were separated and things like that. Those are the type of areas where you can collaborate and get yourself in the classroom, you get your hours for the credential program and so on. So those are some ways that I would start. Uh, these are some of the simple, easy uh, lesson plans that I've done or I've seen done within our ambassador. My program that I teach for is actually called the Forensic Biotech Academy at Enox High School in Modesto. And we also, weirdly enough, like do a lot of STEM outreach, just like we do here for the STEM ambassador program. It's almost like I was meant to do the program because of all the work I put in here. Uh, but we will also bring out... Um, these types of labs to other school sites and you guys can do the same so dna extraction i try that one gets really messy when you're at a park somewhere trying to do it so you're of course going to try to keep that one as clean as possible uh, fingerprinting analysis i do that where the kids will like compare their fingerprints amongst their friends we're forensic so that kind of goes hand in hand for us yeast and sugar for fermentation have them use different types of sugars or not use sugar and see if the little yeast will eat them up. We're actually doing a biofuel lab right now with my seniors and they have to bring in their own biomass, but ours is we're using an enzyme to break down the cellulose. Then we're introducing the yeast and so on. So can elevate that. Rainbow density columns, drops on a penny. We're talking about surface tension. Coincidentally enough, I'm about to do this in my applied chemistry and biotech class. We're talking about water sense, uh, super, uh, surface tension. And the temperature of the water, does that affect surface tension as well? Solar s'more ovens, egg drop challenge. I did that at the middle school level. They absolutely loved it. pH scale, the classic baking soda vinegar. Anytime they see fizzy and explosions, they get super excited for it. Um, I did pitfall traps on campus here. We had an entomology day, part of my biology week. And I figured out where all the cockroaches live on this campus. <laughs> They're nasty. They're all out there. Um, and then I also discovered, I did a pitfall traps on my campus and I also found more cockroaches. I think it's just like a Central Valley problem. I was like, I'm never doing pitfall traps again, but they're fun. So I know that we're like a small group and then we had like this worksheet and Janelle, I don't know if you have access to it. You may have, I know like Dr. Grovner may have sent the, the worksheet that we have. There, no, but for our online guests. Watch. Yeah, you sent them to them? Okay. Um, we, we're going to kind of start looking at to at this little 5E model that I'm going to discuss with you in a moment. So for a moment, just for a second, I want you to brainstorm. We're going to apply the lesson planning process. We're going to start with something super basic. Maybe I gave up some ideas. Maybe you have a lab that you know is super simple, an activity maybe you've done with your siblings or cousins or whomever. Um, let me give you a moment, but pick one little hands-on lab 
or activity that you'd want to do with kids. Okay? Come give me a moment. You have pens and pens. I might eat a cookie for a second. I need this sugar. We have extra pens. So long. All right, Janelle, what activity do you think you're going to start with for your lesson? It could totally be mathematic. Throw some math at me. Is it okay if I use the mic? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Um, I, I guess I was kind of thinking like a lesson about, um, like, like slopes and stuff, like graphing. Okay. And so like to begin, I think it would kind of be like, I don't know, like making them think about like, for example, if you could build any house with stairs, how would that look like? You know what I mean? Because okay. if you go up the stairs, I don't know if that's like okay. super interactive. No, no, we're going to, we are going to marinate on that and we are totally going to dissect it. Because I, I, we have the idea that you want them to learn slopes of some form. And then I'll tell, I'll, I'll show you how we're going to break that down. Maybe we can make it exciting. We can use a lot of physics in that. What are you, your ladies thinking? I was thinking about like a pH type of lab. Okay. Um, I've seen this activity online. I've seen a YouTuber do it. There's these pills that you buy online and they're supposed to like change your taste buds. Like, I guess it's like candy that you eat. And like you can eat fruits or like vegetables and it'll taste like candy to you or something. Ooh. So I think that could be interesting for like a pH. I want to do that to my juniors. <laughs> I forgot the name of the pill that they sold. It's not even a pill. It's like a little tablet. Volcanoes? Yeah. Oh. Because I know I've done it before. And yeah, like a bunch of baking soda when they're coming with a mint, and it actually does it. And a mint? Oh, I haven't seen it with a mint. So the mint doesn't makes it more like projected, kind of. We have like a plastic volcano. We always do it for like one of our little like science fair things. But it's so anti-dramatic. It's just like, you know. I didn't know about the mint thing. Okay, that's interesting. We are picking a topic to make a lesson. Oh, okay. Second. We grab a burrito. Dr. Grover <laughs> All right. Well, then now that we have like determined a topic, that's where we start with our idea. Uh, so I'm going to show you uh, something kind of like, it's just like a, a classic lesson planning um, tool that we use for like a lot of introductory teachers. If you want the credential program, this is what we use. Um, if you, in all honesty, every school district is different. There are, they, we, to do good lesson planning, we start here. But then once you get the hang of it, this isn't always the 100% the model that we use. Every district's different. Every district is going to be like, this is how I want your learning intentions. This is how I want your objectives. There's so many different words for different things. These certain different teaching strategies that every district wants you to focus on. For me, it's like learning intentions, success criteria. And we're big right now on student collaboration to get students to talk again. Because um, you guys might be feeling that in your classes where you guys don't talk. Uh, maybe when the, the professor puts like a, a question up and Zoom, um, it's a lot easier for you to talk in that versus when you're in a classroom together and it's like crickets and all a lot of people talk. We're seeing that at every level and hopefully it'll improve. I think COVID's part of that. Um, so that's what we're working on for that. But we're doing our lesson plan. We have what we call a 5E lesson plan. It's like five steps. And I'm going to break them down as we go. Um, first step is engage. How are we hooking them? How are we introducing them into this topic? Um, also, we we'll use engaging to kind of check to see where they're at, especially when we get getting kids here on site at San State. We don't know what their learning level is. We don't know how much they know about that topic. 
So sometimes this uh, engage piece kind of shows us where they're at. Exploring is when they start working hands on, when they're working together, that's when they're like solving problems together. Then we can explain it. So instead of you always up here doing, 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 we need more of them doing the thing. They need to be asking the questions. They need to kind of like start researching and getting it together. Uh, elaborating and evaluating. So these two steps, sometimes like you won't get here, at least at the STEM ambassador program. These steps are not necessarily one day in an in a actual classroom. Because I like have an hour for kids. This would be like, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. In reality, these might be the first day. This could be two and three days. This is the assessment. So this could be like end of the week and then assessment and stuff like that. So that you definitely would not go through all 5E in a normal classroom in one day anyways. So now that we have your topics and your ideas, so I gave you your lesson plan template, right? Let's see. Um, on there, it's asking you, you're the grade level, school program, topic NGSSS, what is the learning intention, needed materials, and before class setup. Um, all right, I'm gonna go over standard things. So what do you want them to learn? Do you want them to learn how to make a volcano explode, or maybe you want them to learn why volcanoes explode. Um, maybe you want them to learn about the pH levels, and you want them to learn about slopes. What do you want them to learn? My late Homer. Like, like what in general? Or? Yeah, pick one thing that you're going to try to teach. Math. 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 Okay, what specifically? Fractions. Fractions. Oh, bless you. Yes, let's do fractions. My kids. I'm doing good. Oh, well, my kids don't even know how to, never mind. But fractions, good. So your learning intention would be for students to solve simple fraction problems, okay? One half, one fourth, all that kind of stuff. What are your materials? So if you're doing volcano, obviously you're gonna need something to build a volcano with. You're gonna need vinegar, baking soda, how many of each? Where are those kids? How many, like you gotta think of like, am I gonna have the kids in groups? Am I gonna have them individually? It's always cheaper to put them in groups so that they can share the materials. Start just um, assigning kids roles in each group. Like you're the data taker, you're the leader, you're the one that makes sure that we got our lab safety on and stuff like that. Because if the kids don't have roles, they're gonna do whatever they want and not listen anyways. So you gotta kind of keep them active and so on. So I'm gonna give you about two seconds to fill this out in like a minute. That's okay. And I will go over the standard. You guys aren't familiar with them. Good. Janelle, are you good? Yeah. Cool. All right, moving on. All right, so I know I'm going to go over NGSS for you math people. Um, I don't, not really 100% familiar with your standards. I know that they're kind of just as messy as like my next generation standards. I wonder if I can access this is going to come up okay from my standpoint. Okay. So uh, this website that I have here is called the Next Generation Standards. This is like, if you ever want to know what anybody's learning in the state of California in all schools, this is where you pull from. Um, if, you want, if you have siblings or nieces and nephews, you want to know what science they're learning in first grade, 
it should be here and they should be covering it. I taught, I've also taught general bio and what my experience with it is that we will cover most of it. And in, in reality, a teacher's not gonna get through like 100% of it. What a lot of districts do is that they go and dive through these standards and just and determine which ones are essential. Like which ones do they want the entire district to fully understand? And then we just kind of go from there. Um, so this gets a little convoluted, but you could, for example, say we want to talk about pH. Heather? Yeah. It's not showing that up. Oh, it's not? No, because you're sharing the PowerPoint screen. Oh. So it's sharing. I'm so sorry, Janelle. The screen? Okay, there we go. There we go. We good now? Good? Okay, perfect. So here is the website. Uh, you could play on this, but one of my chief things is maybe pH. Let's look for what grade do you want for pH? Middle school? Eighth grade. Eighth grade? Middle school. Go middle school. See if it's even a. Now, here's the thing is that pH might not be a middle school thing. So here's all the different standards. We say MS stands for middle school, PS stands for physical science, and 1 1 is just kind of like the category that it's in. Interesting. Well, let's do matter and its interaction. Okay. So here you have, this is the standard and you might look at that and be like, oh my goodness, am I gonna cover every five seconds of that? Um, we have something in our NGS standards um, called the essential or the evidence statements that are over here on the right where it says relative evidence statements. If you just click on one of these, it's gonna break that standard down for you. So right down here in these little like tables uh, where it says organizing data, like tab A and B, that might just be one lesson for me. And then tab A might be another lesson. And then A, B down here, like all of these down here are kind of what breaks apart that standard. Now, if you are trying to do an activity and you want to relate it to NGSS because that's a great hot selling point, especially if you want teachers to kind of recruit from their classrooms and they're going to know, oh, wow, they're covering um, NGSS standard MS-PS1-2 and then the teacher looked up like that's part of my unit i'm not gonna be able to cover that i'm gonna give my kids some extra credit if they come to your program uh, because i know they're gonna get that extra um, engagement so this is just kind of help you align your topic with the standard that we have for the state of california there's so many of these you can dive into them I, even though i'm a cte teacher i still have to align my stuff with the ngss standards as well so i dip both into the physical science and the uh, biology life sciences as well um, the big thing in California is not just incorporating the science. They want are trying to do this like twist of, say you're teaching biology, but we want some earth science in it. If you're teaching chemistry, they also want to incorporate earth science in it. Luckily, I just teach biotech. And a little bit of it has earth science, but not like a lot of it. Um, so that's why I just wanted to address the state standards because this is why we teach and where and how we teach. And you guys have a kind of a better background of where it's at. Okay, so here we are at Engage and Explore. These are the pieces that you can kind of start jotting down maybe like some notes or anything that I start talking about. That way we could break down each step and where it might look for you. And engaging, how do I hook a kid into math? How do I hook a kid into um, chemistry and things like that? When you have your students, especially if they're here at Stan State, they may not know each other. Um, and you have them for three hours. How are you gonna entertain them for three hours? You can start with icebreakers. I'm sure you guys have been victims of icebreakers. I say that jokingly because we all know when we're dragging ourselves in half awake into the classroom or meetings, trust, they do it to us teachers too in our faculty meetings. We're gonna get to know each other, okay? Uh, so icebreakers that are really common, of course, are like, find someone who's, we're like, 
or you find your soul partner and you go look for somebody with the same shoe, get it, soul, shoe, you know, or um, you have like questions around the room, they have to turn and talk. Um, there, or there's like a, a ball that you could use to like throw around the room and the ball has different questions on it. You could do like a basket throwing one. There's a lot of icebreakers. If you literally just Google icebreakers for middle school kids, you'll get a huge long list. Edutopia is a great resource for that. Um, I'll show you what I do towards the end of something that I use when I'm using kids. But I think uh, my seniors that I have I already had them their junior year, so I don't need, I don't need an icebreaker. Uh, so you could also propose questions. I do like a group question about maybe you talk about acids and bases for pH, and you can do like a like a word, like a word bank or something they can log into, or you can have them draw around the room. Like when you hear the word acid, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? And if they're middle school, they're gonna have some off the wall what answers, right? Or when you hear the word base, what do you think? And then that is also identifying for you like common misconceptions as well. <clears throat> um, or provide a hook for a question to solve. In that case, uh, for math, maybe there is a problem at a construction site and you are the person that's gonna solve it. <laughs> Maybe you have to like swing something across the barn. What is the slope or the angle? Or like you said, you wanna build stairs. Even though you're saying it's just stairs, but you make it, the stairs are going to a magical place. Um, maybe they're like building a new roller coaster and we gotta to get to the top and this is our challenge. Um, so if you kind of incorporate cute little stories in, involved, that kind of gets them a little hyped other than uh, Y equals MX plus B we're going to solve it. And you're like, well, why? Okay. Uh, so if you kind of incorporate that cuteness to it, especially middle school, they're just young enough where they think they're cool, but young enough to want to please you at the same time. So they're, they're, they're down for it. <clears throat> so what does that look like? Notice how I have the column that's divided where it says teacher does and student does. So in that moment of engaging, what are the students doing? This is where they're communicating during the icebreakers. This is where they are um, meeting each other. This is where if you're going to have a question, maybe they're writing something down. Maybe they're drawing something. Uh, maybe they're logging into like a Kahoot or a quick check for understanding as well. Maybe they are listening and taking notes while you have a really cool explosion video for some form of chemistry. And then, <clears throat> and they're also repeating directions and making acknowledgements. So in reality, on the right hand side where the student does, they should be doing more than you. This lesson planning workshop is a, a terrible example of a 5E. It's terrible because what's happening right now? I'm talking a lot. And I would be a better teacher if I incorporated these 5E strategies here, the four of us present in the one online, which makes that kind of a little more of a, a difficult, but I taught during hybrid learning where I had students in the classroom and online at the same time. I will never want that again, but I could do it. I can make it work. Um, <clears throat> so make sure they're doing more than you are. And the nice part about the ambassador program is that it's not just you. You have several other ambassadors in the room. You have several other adults that are in charge that are in the room with you. So they can constantly pace the room, make sure students are on task and paying attention and doing what they're supposed to be doing. So once you move on from engage, how are they going to explore your topic? How are they gonna start learning your topic? Um, you can do something like a lab. You can start setting them up with directions. You can start providing more hands-on work. If they're, if they're younger, you want to keep them moving. If you have station activities, that's usually beautiful for them, middle school and younger kids. If you keep kids sitting for like three hours straight, they get fidgety. They start, you know, throwing things at each other. Um, they start making weird noises just to make the whole class laugh. So I would like in exploring, I would probably have a couple activities, start rotating them around, keep their little bodies moving and doing the thing. Um, even for me, if I'm sitting for three hours, I, I, my little baby ADD starts checking out too. So in exploring, you shouldn't be 
the one up here talking like I am right now. Students are working together and um, it's basically hands on at this point. So what does that look like for the student? There, you also have to reiterate to make sure to respect materials. They might be writing, they're listening, they're speaking, they're collaborating. So again, we are re um, adjusting and getting students to communicate and collaborate, which is a key thing right now in education. Any questions so far? No? Will we get to explain, elaborate, and evaluate um, some of these, like, if you are using that three hour time slot, I would use like the first 15 minutes or so to use the icebreaker, the checking for understanding, the uh, hook and stuff like that for the engagement piece. Then a huge chunk, solid half of it would be the exploring parts, having those activities, proposing, maybe you propose a question at the end, like how are we gonna get them to up this magical staircase or whatever, you know what I mean, that kind of stuff. Um, so like if you had the volcano activity, what I would do is not only what I would do volcanoes, I'd probably throw some like tectonic plates in there too. Some examples of how to do that. If I was doing pH, I would also have uh, pH indicators out, maybe using like cabbage and stuff. And so we'd have different stages indicating pH. Math, I really wish I could give you more examples. So maybe you could do like stations where you start layering on the difficulty where you start at the baseline, incorporating real world examples. I noticed that a lot of students will struggle if you just lay out one little problem to them, it doesn't click unless it's applied to a real world strategy. So maybe you can give them a task, a challenge. Maybe the, the fastest group to complete these 10 correctly will get a candy at the end or they start um, you could have like an invisible, you could have like a physical ladder in the classroom. Like, I don't know, go into your ladder idea and start moving each team up that ladder and that's going to get them involved too. Those are like things how I would like try to get kids involved. Um, so at the end of it, we would kind of start explaining. That's where we, um, the teacher or the students start feedbacking to you. What did we learn? Why did this thing do the thing? What do you think? And that's when we as teachers, that's when we kind of start connecting to prior knowledge. You probably will not have this time in STEM ambassador stuff where you're gonna give them another lesson and then another lesson's laying on and another one. We ain't got time for that. But maybe you proposed a question, gave a little bit of background stuff in the beginning. And then we keep like, hey, remember when I mentioned that one thing? Do you think that ties into this? then maybe that like will help get that brain going. So what are you doing in explaining? You're checking in with students, you're guiding their thinking with the data that they get and why they got those results. And if they get it wrong, that's okay. They're not the STEM ambassador stuff. We're not there, they're not there for a grade, they're there to do hands-on STEM stuff. They're there to kind of get that extra low stress, hands-on activity that they would get from their classroom. So the students in that case would be analyzing their data, discussing with you and the peers, with their pairs, and even discussing their errors. Errors, errors. I had a pretty loud today in my brain right now. <laughs> so the uh, error, like we, my big thing in my classroom, I have labs because I teach biotech that take four days to do, okay? And if by the end of it, they didn't get what they needed to do, am I gonna fail them? At least not my class, because I want them to understand where those errors were made. Go back through the procedure, where they do the math wrong, and then of course discuss that, discuss that in their conclusion. And as long as they have that safety net in the classroom, knowing that if they fail, it's okay. They're more willing to keep doing and not giving up and throwing themselves on the ground. Had one kid. <laughs> Um, and then, so once they're done explaining, now you can kind of elaborate even further, provide those real world examples, maybe link some careers. Like, oh, I'm glad that you now learn how to develop slope. These people have these careers and they're able to do that and they make a ton of money in engineering because of it. Um, we have chemists that deal with pH. And, and then of course, if they get too much medicine or their, their organs are not right and their pH goes off, and people die. Like 
it sounds crazy, but it helps them connect those things too. And the students then would reflect in the lab rating. How would they improve on the lab, discuss, dry, draw, or write out how this applies to their own lives too. You may not get to elaborate, and that's okay, but you could sprinkle in elaborate as you go. So the order, like as long as like engage is kind of like the beginning, you can kind of, re I would be okay with reversing some of these books. And the evaluate, I always joke, is the teacher's job. It's not your job to test or assess. I mean, you can, but no student wants to come in on a weekend and take an exam, right? But uh, here, what I would do is be like, how will you know the students met that learning intention? How am I gonna know? Usually for me, it's a lab write-up, maybe a quick quiz. Um, I even use, um, you guys familiar with like the cahoots and the gim kits and the booklets and things like that? I'll even use those virtual games as an assessment to see where they're at to you. Uh, this, you can do what we call an exit ticket. Those of you guys who are younger are probably familiar with exit tickets now where you just give them sticky notes and I tell them, you go know, smack what you know on the door and then they'll write like, oh, today I learned or did I meet my success criteria this day? Um, and then I talk about, I don't know, maybe a struggle they had that day and how they would improve. That's how I would like close it up. But again, this may not always be for you guys. Questions about explain, elaborate and evaluate. a lot right look at your faces i can tell it's a lot for some of you that's okay it's a friday okay so when i'm talking about uh presenting lessons to students these are just some of my examples of engagement keeping them on task uh, ways to have them answer questions um it's not, don't, don't beat yourself up if it doesn't always work because you never know what kind of students you're getting with our ambassador program. I mean, in the many of times that I've done it, I mean, we've had some students that, how can I say, it's like we have students that come in, they have what we call IEPs and we don't know it. Uh, it's something called like an individualized education planner for students who might be on the spectrum, have ADHD, or have some other um, learning disability that need more support. So when we get those students forever burn, we don't always know that ahead of time. Uh, so you just gotta adapt and don't freak out. Like you'll be totally okay as long as you don't take kids too seriously, especially if you try to clap back at you, just chill like you'll be all right. Yes. Um, so create, make sure your environment is positive first. The moment they walk in that door, greet them, say, hey, how's it going? I know you college kids are great with like high-fiving the littles and they think they're so cool because they're hanging out with college kids. Um, use those icebreakers, like I said, for them to get to know each other, to kind of break that, literally the tension that's in the room when they're all looking at each other. The classmate bingo, I'm gonna show you the bingo I use for my class. They can vote with their feet. So if you put like, say, hey, if you like Disneyland, go to the left side, but if you prefer Universal, go to the right side. And then they'll like all spread out like chaos. And if you put like flaming hot Cheetos against Takis, it gets real serious because if you get food involved, like they're all, they're all down for that. Uh, would you rather questions? And there's like I said, there's like super, so many of them. There's a gummy bear share and there's like an M&M &M version too, where you give them a little, pack, like those little fun size packs of candy and then you dish them out. And then as they eat it, like if they get a red um, gummy bear, they have to talk about what their favorite color is. They get an orange one in their packet. They got to talk about their food. Gives them an excuse to eat candy and talk to each other. I would keep slides simple. I did a terrible job of that because I wanted to do an, um, information overload a little bit for those of you that like want to come back and look at my slides. But uh, keep slides simple and with lots of images and examples because you might be using STEM terms that they don't understand, especially at the college level. Something that we think is so easy may not, um, they may not comprehend. And I mean this in all actuality. So when I mean my so easy, some of them don't know how to read a clock. They may not know where California is located on a map. Like those things that sound so common sense to us, they may not get. 
Um, always model the things you want them to do. Don't be like, all right, pour it in the beaker and then just send them off. They're gonna be like, what's a beaker? What am I pouring? So you literally stand up there and be like, this is the beaker, this is the liquid and we're gonna pour it in. So you gotta like physically show them and model it for them. We always model, always, what we want the behavior to do. Even if they're doing like a discussion, maybe take two people and have them model what a good discussion looks like. Like, hi, my name is so-and-so. Hi, so-and-so, nice to meet you. Hey, what do you think about photosynthesis? I think photosynthesis is great. <laughs> You to model that behavior that way they know what the expectation is just like right out the gate. I already said about stations and rotations, keep them moving. Uh, closure, think about like how you going to end that day. What are what activity? What question? What are you going to propose for them to do before they leave? I know there's that lull where like the parents start showing up ten minutes before the event is over. Now they're excited because parents are here. They want to show them their things. Make sure you have a little bit of something at the end before they leave. Whether it is like that little piece of paper, usually they have surveys they have to fill out like for the ambassador program. Um, and I can't say this enough where I'm always like, just be excited about what you are talking about and be happy that your students are here. Nobody wants to be in a room with a teacher who hates their job. It makes the whole vibe in the classroom just like depletes. And the kids feel that energy off of you and they're they're checked out now. They're like, well, if they don't care, I don't care. Um, so this is my find someone who format that I use. Um, it's really easy. I did it in a slide and just put fixed out the format to 8.5 by 11, created a table. And I have all these questions on here and I go around the room with the students and I have somebody initial where they're at. So like, likes to go fishing, they have a pet, they went to Ustack Middle School, it likes to book, bake, or cook, and they're the oldest sibling. So the catch is when I find someone who bingo, it's that everything that's on here has to do with me. And so if they sign one thing on there, that means that they have something in common with me. And then they like feel, oh, I met the teacher and I have something in common. So they either like enjoy that or they feel awkward about it. Like, oh God, you know, like, I don't know. High school kids are weird. But um, so it's just really interesting to kind of make that connection with your, with your students like really early on. And then um, if you have yours and you kept it signed, you kind of use that as a check-in like, oh, hey, I noticed that you love racing. What team do you go for? What do you want? Is it Formula One? Is it NASCAR? We can go back and forth all day about that. You guys done, done anything like this before? The bingos? The teacher do something similar? It was theirs? Yeah? Maybe? You have Janelle has? Ugh. You gotta make it about you. It's always about you in the classroom. Just kidding. Um, let's see. Um, just some quick like classroom management because uh, I think a lot of people are more afraid of like the kids oh, like not listening. Kids are gonna yell at me. The kids are gonna throw some stuff at you. They always like, always like the worst case scenario. You come in timid, they're gonna be timid. They're gonna, they're gonna feel that. They, they love messing with those that, they, that they can fear. Um, so I could honestly create an entire workshop around classroom management. There's so many strategies, so many things that you can do. There's there's a lot of psychology to classroom management too because the kids that misbehave aren't always intentionally there to like make you upset there's some underlying something else that's going on with them they just don't know how to always project how they're feeling um so my first one always is don't panic i always tell my students i'm never gonna flip out on them i my biggest fear is to end up on the, the teacher flip outs on TikTok. If you guys have seen those teacher rage videos. I don't want to ever be that teacher. That's, that's a, a real fear on me. But my experience in the medical field between the, um, the one-on-ones and working with people of all different mental health issues, um, I've been, I always tell my students, I was like, I've been kicked at, punched at, cussed at, thrown pooped at, like everything that under the sun has happened to me working in the medical field. So a little feisty, spicy, like teenager, 
This ain't nothing. It ain't nothing on me. So um, don't take them too seriously. They're mad. It's not really honestly because of you. They're probably having a bad day. There's something going on outside of them. Just, just be calm and address it calmly. Um, and there's cell phones. There's always cell phones. You guys carry cell phones. And the moment something's about to tick off, like in the classroom, the first thing that's going to happen is the phone's out. We've had um, fights break out in classrooms, and kids aren't saving, they're videotaping. So that's a reality that we're in a world that we are living in. So you always got to keep your composure under control so that you don't end up as the next victim to social media. Um, make sure you set the rules and consequences right at the beginning. So as soon as they walk in, they're greeted and be like, oh, hey, welcome to our workshop. These are our expectations. And if you, you know, we're, if you're something really bad is going to happen and say you start throwing things or like, you know, playing with the lab equipment like you're not supposed to. The nice part about the STEM ambassador program is that they get booted. For a call home and then your parents are gonna have to come pick you up and we won't re-sign you up for a program. Me on the other hand, I just have to tell them to sit outside and we have a conversation. It ends up being a whole four step process. Um, and then um, you and the other STEM ambassadors are constantly roaming the room. You have other people that are helping you with whatever the activity is. Constantly engage those kids. Check in what they're doing. My pet peeve when I was doing the STEM ambassador program was sometimes people just hang on the back wall. And the kids were doing stuff. And then, you know, we're college kids. We want to mingle too. But your time there is for the kids. Break off that wall and go pick a partner. Go pick a buddy. And like, say you got like, and here I noticed there's one, two, three, four, like seven tables. I would put a STEM ambassador at every table and do a role. Like, all right, you're responsible for this table. These are your kids. And then they become your buddy the rest of the day. I do that with my my uh, high school students. I do a CSI camp with medicine police department and I assign them to a table and then they love it. Now the little kids get to hang out, high school kids and it ends up being a whole thing. It's okay to tell a student no. I think sometimes we always just wanna appease them thinking that if we're just gonna give them, they're gonna like, you know, be cool about it. But there's ways to tell them no. You can be like, hey, that's not a good idea because of X, Y, and Z, you're gonna end up like poking your eye out, kid, please give me the knife. <laughs> but in reality, yeah, like we like something to redirect them. Hey, that's not a good idea. Why don't you go over here and help somebody else? They need your help instead of me. Always re redirect that behavior, tell them no. And if they don't listen, tell Dr. Grobner. Um, and another way to keep those behaviors is, um, is to acknowledge the good behavior. You notice a group is cleaning up really well. You'd be like, hey, Table one, you're doing a great job cleaning up and making sure your table is nice and organized. I like that. Oh, I see table number four about to do the same thing. And once you start calling out those behaviors, the other kids are looking around and they're like, oh, she recognizes them, maybe she'll recognize me. And because they're younger, they kind of want to do that for you. Uh, so they'll already kind of start setting that off. Um, I had Jolly Ranchers with me and I would start throwing them at random groups. I'd be like, first five, the sit down, have this organized you're going to get Jolly Rancher and like, one, two, three, four, five. And then you should see the chaos unfold when they're all trying to get the Jolly Ranchers, but it works. Um, and then of course, like I said, any serious behavior, see Dr. Grobner or who any other staff, faculty or staff that is responsible for that event. I think I maybe like in all of the time that we've worked together, I think there was one time where I've had to have Dr. Grobner handle the situation. It was a kid um, that just didn't know how to handle his emotions kind of. Wasn't that bad, but we had to remove it. And that's it. Literally, that's all I have. It's at six o'clock the next day. I was like, I better be done around the Do I have any questions? Whether it's credentialing, labs, a job. You guys are tired, it's Friday. Get it. Janelle.